Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. I'm Christopher Brown. Now, today we are honored to be sitting down and speaking with Dufferin County Warden Darren White, who also serves as the mayor of Melanchthon, Ontario. Dufferin County is a primarily rural destination that spans over 150,000 hectares in central Ontario. This county is home to three main urban areas, Grand Valley, Orangeville, and Shelburne, with more small towns dotting the countryside. Enjoy the welcoming charm of the country life at one of the area's fall fairs, farmers markets, and festivals. Popular events include the Orangeville Blues and Jazz Festival, the Dufferin Multicultural Festival, and Shelburne's Fall Fair, complete with farming exhibits, pancake breakfast, and agricultural exhibits. Explore the nature trails, parks, and conservation areas throughout Dufferin County, where hiking, cycling, and fishing opportunities abound. So stay tuned, and we'll be right back after a quick message with cross-border interviews featuring Dufferin County Warden. Darren White. In the heart of every thriving community lies a well-crafted strategic plan. But crafting such a plan requires expertise, experience, and a deep understanding of local needs. Enter Strategic Steps, your partner in municipal strategic planning. Strategic Steps team of experts have years of experience in municipal administration at Strategic Steps, they just don't develop plans. They co-create homegrown strategies tailored to your unique community. They listen, they collaborate, they empower your community to thrive. Contact Strategic Steps today and take the first step towards a brighter future for your municipality. Call Strategic Steps at 780-416-9255 or visit strategicsteps.ca to get started. Warden, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start by talking about you for a few minutes, if you don't mind. And I'm going to ask this question I've asked every person who's ever come on the show, so you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Darren? Well, uh, I mean, a, a number of different places. First of all, when I was uh, a child, I was uh, joined the Boy Scouts Um in in grade school i mean i've always been involved one way or another in my community um i stayed with the boy scouts for a number of years i uh i ended up working with the uh the royal canadian army cadet program as an officer now and now i'm in the reserves um i, I joined that program when my kids went to the army cadet so i've always had a sense of service i, I got a lot of it from my parents and my family who always believe a little bit of giving back to their community and, and doing something, even if it's a small thing. How does, so I, I traditionally don't do a lot of research, but I think that the one thing I did find out about your background is you're not originally from Ontario. You're from Newfoundland and Labrador. How does the, how I does am. someone from Newfoundland, Labrador, I think Labrador city, if I'm not mistaken, become Absolutely. the mayor and warden of a County <laughs> in central Ontario. What was that well, journey like? <laughs> well, um, when I was in high school, uh, it was in the 80s, uh, early 80s in Labrador, and Labrador City is a an iron ore mining town, a single industry mining town. I wasn't much interested in mining, um, and uh, I was helped along in that fact by, uh, you know, the, the sort of recession of the day, uh, which saw steel prices uh, tanking, uh, which meant there was a lot of layoffs and a lot of high unemployment in my hometown, and, and there was... Uh, Oftentimes, uh, you're you're found your parents or your dad was uh, you know wondering if the next round of layoffs were going to catch up with him. Uh, I didn't I didn't really want that for my life. So once I uh, got out of high school, uh, I had always had a dream of living in the big city, uh, uh, going from a tiny little town of about ten thousand people in in the middle of nowhere, Labrador. Uh, I thought you know my next step was Toronto, so I moved to Ontario in eighty seven. And, uh, you know, I thought it was great. I came from a, a very northern, cold, long winter mining town to a place where in January it wasn't generally that cold. I thought I had hit the jackpot. Uh, so I'd lived in Toronto for a number of years, for almost uh, 15, 16 years, um, working in construction and uh, odd jobs and different kind of things. And uh, at one point I met my wife. We moved to out of the city out of the city of Toronto to the city of Brampton, 
uh, where we stayed a couple of years. And then we moved up uh, to Orangeville in Dufferin County. And, um, you know, at, at one point we bought a house out in the country in Melanchthon, which is where we are today. Uh, we've lived, I've lived here about 20 years and I've been uh, in local politics for about 15 of those, uh, 12 as the mayor. Um, so it's been, it's been a weird journey, I will say. It's not a typical, uh, how do you get to be the mayor kind of journey. It uh, came with a lot of twists and turns and and strangeness and even the way I actually got into politics itself was kind of strange but well um, and and that's where I want to talk about if you don't mind for a second because it, it seems with your background you potential federal involvement potential provincial but 15 years ago as you just said you chose the municipal route what was it about yeah. the municipal arena that drew Darren White into it well, at the time that I got into it, we had a very big issue here in Melanchthon. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Mega Quarry. It was a company from the, the States came along to, uh, they wanted to, they bought up a pile of property, wanted to put a 2,300 acre, uh, 200 foot deep quarry in. Uh, so there was a lot of opposition to that. And I had studied environmental science. I went back to school about 20 years ago and studied environmental science. Uh, so I knew a little bit about it. Uh, so I, I tried to get involved with that. The actual way I, I got in politics, ironically, was on a dare or a challenge, which, <laughs> which is not something you generally hear from a lot of politicians. But uh, uh, yeah, so I mean, when I went back to school, I, uh, I was an older person in uh, a classroom full of 20 somethings. Um, and my environmental law professor, we used to have debates because she'd make statements. And uh, I'd say, but in the real world, uh, dot, dot, dot. And then we'd have these debates where the class would just sit and watch us. So when a, uh, a person on my council retired in the middle of the term, there was a spot available. Uh, I mentioned that to her and she said, well, now it's time to put up or shut up. So I put up and that evolved into uh, me gaining a council seat for a short, short period of time. I subsequently ran for deputy mayor and then mayor after that. And here we are. And uh, throughout that journey, uh, the mayors and deputy mayors of our eight municipalities in Dufferin County sit at the county level as well. And uh, every year we elect one of those people on that council to be the warden. And uh, I'm lucky enough to have served as warden now for five five terms. Prior to entering into the political arena in that by-election, had you paid attention to what was going on at city council because while you say you were sort of pushed into it by a dare when i talk to municipal leaders not only in ontario but across canada i often hear the same story of yes i paid attention but it wasn't really going to council meetings or reading the agenda were you aware what was going on in the community prior to that quarry sort of challenges being brought up or was it something as long as my uh, taxes are paid and my uh, as long as my taxes are low my garbage picked up and my water's turned on i'm comfortable with what's going on in the community so at at the time we had two real big issues one was the mega quarry and the other was wind turbines we're the first uh municipality in in ontario uh to host uh large wind um wind farms and uh so there was a lot of opposition to both so i was aware of both of those things but if you had asked me even maybe two months before i put my name forward I would have said, yeah, no, thanks. Uh, I'm not interested. Uh, you know, I'm just going to keep doing my own thing here in the house. And, and, uh, but uh, when, it, when I was challenged, I don't back down from a challenge first of all. <laughs> so that was part of it. But, uh, but as I got to know more about some of the smaller issues and, and the more sort of, uh, uh, you know, outer, outer issues in the ring, I mean, I became very much interested in, and once I got that spot on council, I really, really started to like that type of work and being involved and, and you know, knowing the ins and outs of issues. So that's sort of the, uh, the, the impetus of it or genesis of it. 15 years on council, a few years on regional or sort of Dufferin County yeah. Council. Has the role of the municipality, particularly at the township level or even at the county level, changed as much as you thought it would in those 15 years or is the issues that you're dealing with in uh, 2024 the same same that you were dealing with in when you first were elected back 15 years ago 
No, not at all. I mean, it's it's substantially different right now. There's been a lot of legislative change at the provincial level, which has changed the municipal level substantially. Uh, when I first got involved, I mean, I'm, it, it shows sort of the progression, but when I first got involved, our agenda packages were, you know, you got 300 pages of paper in an envelope and that was your agenda package. And now we're, you know, everything is Zoom and computerized in that short period of time. I mean, fundamentally, everything has changed. Um, our our local municipalities, the eight of them, I mean, have been forced to adapt rather quickly to a changing world, uh, you know, thanks to COVID, but thanks to other things as well, thanks to change at the, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, the stripe of the provincial government. We had a liberal government for 15 years, and now we're into, I think, year seven of a PC government. So we've gone from, you know, one very defined direction to another very defined direction and have had to adapt as a result. But it's it's nothing like uh, when I first got involved, nothing like it at all. What's been the biggest change from uh, from a local perspective that you would say has probably been the most eye opening experience? Because we have people who listen to the show who are thinking about putting themselves into that position of running for council or putting themselves in that position of running for re-election. What advice would you say about the sort of the adaptation that one has to go through about being flexible on a council as a councillor or even as mayor or as warden as well? Well, I mean, the first thing I tell people is you have to be willing to do the work. Um, you know, as in any other business, there's uh, there's folks here who, who just want the title or want the position, uh, but they don't realize the amount of work that comes behind it. Um, most local politicians across the country in anywhere that's not the size of Toronto or Edmonton or Calgary, uh, those folks are not being paid very well. It is essentially... A, you know, it's it's said it's a part time job, but it's really a full time job. But it's uh, they're not paid very well, so you have to do it because you want to make a difference. Um, if if you're expecting a, a lot of benefits and bonuses, I mean, it's the wrong it's the wrong career path for you. Um, so, in addition to having to be willing to do the work, you have to be flexible. You have to be able to listen to people. Uh, even if you don't agree, and most particularly when you don't agree with their position, you have to be willing to listen to people to understand what their fundamental problem is with an issue and to try to be responsive to that, even if you don't agree. Okay, so you you brought up something that I like to play in the sandbox for a little bit, if you don't mind, Darren. You're right. The The role of a counselor is one is about communication. Communication is at the key of the job. You have to listen to everyone, even the people who didn't vote for you who, or who don't agree with you. But on the flip side of that, you are the vote. You are the one that has to put up their hand and say yes or no to a decision. How do you make the decision on the, the for the best of the community at a township level, at a county level, knowing that 100% of the people are not going to be up, uh, going to be happy with that decision you've made. Is it challenging? Is there ways that you look at, is there metrics that you put every issue through to ensure that the, the vote you make is in the best interest of the entire community, not just the people you vote for, who voted for you? Absolutely. And, and I mean, the way I do it is, I don't know if it's very simple, but it's very sim simple to me. I do I do a lot of research. I do a lot of reading um, on uh, on issues. And I talk to people. I talk to my neighbors. I talk to people in the grocery store. I talk to people at the gas station. Um, you know, I talk and I try to, to listen to what they have to say. Um, I, I realize that every decision that I make, uh, whether a small issue uh, on, you know, a relatively insignificant question or a giant uh, issue on a, a, a really community changing kind of question. Every issue is going to affect somebody. Um, the way I, I don't know if justify it is the right word, but the way I, uh, the way I sleep at night after I make a decision, knowing that a segment of the population is not going to agree with me is that uh, when I'm questioned on, on my decision later, I, I'm 100% fully upfront and honest with people. Even when I know it's not, I'm going to tell them not what they want to hear, uh, but I will tell them what they what they don't want to hear. And I think um, 
most people that I've run into over my career have really respected that. They understand that, you know, and I think I have a reputation that perceives me for doing that. So people understand that I'm I'm going to be honest. And even when I'm telling them some the absolute worst thing that they want to hear with regards to that particular decision. Um, it, so, is it challenging for that, though? Because I can imagine you want to be as honest as possible. But yeah. and, and I'm going to play a little devil's advocate here. So this question might sound stupid, but it's an important one. Yeah. People are struggling right now and they don't want yes. to hear that you're raising their taxes by two percent or one percent or three percent they want to know how your the service levels are going to go up so is it hard to be honest and blunt with people in a day when people are struggling and they don't want the municipal government which is the closest to the people impacting them as much as they could potentially at the end of the day well sometimes it is and and um but part of Part of the the way to deal with that is to be really open and transparent through things like your budget process, what right? So people know uh, what's coming up as well. I'm I'm fairly lucky over the years. Most of my councils don't really ascribe to large budget increases in a year. Uh, we have I have really good municipal managers around me who have you know really well planned reserve funds and whatnots to help smooth off the edges of those years when. Otherwise, there is a big project that that's not uh, not funded or otherwise just you know pops up in mid year. Um, but when it comes to <clears throat> most of our residents, we find or I find I believe that our services are really well done in in my local tier municipality in Melanchthon, where so that people don't really question it. Now I'm 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 sure that if we had a 10% tax increase next year, people would question it. They would want to know. But I also, when I leave the house, I'm prepared to give them the answer of, of what it is and why and what happened. Um, we're lucky out here that we don't get faced with that a lot. In, in Melanchthon specifically, we don't have a lot of really big infrastructure problems. This, we're all, everybody in my municipality is on private wells and septic. So that eliminates, you know, 50% of any municipality's problem areas. Uh, so that makes it, uh, you know, honestly, a little bit easier. I don't have to explain those big sewer projects and, and wastewater treatment plant things. But uh, th- th- I find the answer is honesty and upfront. And be- even telling people uh, the background of an issue before the, the issue is voted on, right? So the fact that... Uh, our council meetings are very poorly attended. Um, tells me that a couple of things. I know people talk about the issues in the public because it's a small community. So, I mean, if I, I hear it in the grocery store. But uh, I also know that if people were, uh, if we were doing things wrong, if we were going in the wrong direction, we'd have a full house at our council meetings. Uh, so people generally, I think, seem to think we're doing a pretty good job here. On that note, apathy seems to be ingrained in the municipal sector politics. Uh, the, the old yeah. saying of as long as the garbage is picked up and the water's turned on, we're comfortable. What's going on? Do you find that people understand what's going on in your community? And on the flip side of that, because you talked about people approaching you and asking you questions about what's going on or wanting to ask you about why you voted on something or why you voted against something. Do you, do you get a sense in your community of Dufferin County or even in the township that people understand the role of the municipality? Because I can imagine, and I'm just throwing it out there, not that I've ever been to your community, but I would assume that you've had to field questions about health care. That is not a, a municipal have- issue. Education, that is not a municipal issue. Really? Defense issues, that is not a municipal issue. Do you find that people understand the role the municipality plays when they are talking to you and when they are engaging with you? Or is there an apathy about even what the role of the municipality or even the county plays? Well, I I think the answer to that is 50-50, really. I think uh, half the population really understands or has a general understanding of what each level of government does. But unfortunately, the other 50% just doesn't. And you're right. I do get a lot of those questions about education. We've dealt with in the last uh, year or so. We've dealt with 
a couple of really big educational based questions where we have had to try to shoehorn our way in to the school boards uh, to get answers because people couldn't get answers from the school boards uh, because they tried, you know, the school boards and some of the provincial entities try to be sort of stand off in the background and go unnoticed. But, you know, my council has, you know, deliberately tried to get ourselves in there to get answers for people on some of those things that aren't our purview. Healthcare being the same. We get asked an awful lot of times by the fundraising arms of the, uh, the local hospital here in Orangeville, um, you know, we'd like you to consider donating $500,000 towards X, Y, or Z. And that's a challenging discussion because the public says, you know, we should, but the problem I believe is if we do, then the government, we're just, we're allowing the government off the hook for what part of their job it is. So we find ourselves oftentimes in those exact types of discussions and, uh, you know, people at the, at the end of the day, it, and it's not necessarily right to say they don't care as long as the garbage is picked up and the roads are plowed, but many people feel that way. It's like, you know, if, if what I need is done, then I don't care about the rest of it. From my perspective, if I had a full council chamber of people who wanted to stand up in question period at every meeting and ask questions for an hour, I would be happy with that. Uh, I I know a lot of politicians wouldn't, uh, but I I really like the the outreach and the, the talking to people and answering their answering their questions and trying to help them with their problems. Um, so, I mean, I'm happy to sit at Tim Hortons after picking up a coffee. For an hour and explain something to somebody who doesn't get doesn't understand it or didn't know um, based on a, a simple question rather than you know just go about my own business i i'm very big on the belief that people should be involved uh i but at the same time i don't subscribe to the the theory that if you don't vote you don't have a say i believe that if you don't vote you do have a right to have a say but you have to realize that you're part of the problem you've helped create the problem by not being engaged in the first place. Uh, I, I'm not willing to dismiss any voter for whatever reason, whether it's party affiliation or side of the issue you're on. I think everybody's opinion is valid. Even young people, to be honest, even people who aren't at the age yet where they vote. Uh, I think uh, getting them engaged is very important. I think it's, it's the, the best way for our country to move forward in a positive direction by getting the youth involved early so they understand. So just on that note, before I switch over to some of the challenges and the accomplishments of the county and the township, do you get a sense that the the next generation is willing to take up the mantle and start tackling some of these issues in Dufferin County? Because, again, I'm painting a broad stroke here, and I hate to do that on the show, but I, I seem to do it a lot, even though I try not to. But do you get a sense that the next generation is not focused on that community and more focused on that centralized what's in it for me mentality or in Dufferin County do you get a sense that the next generation wants to step up wants to actually help out and wants to like give ideas of the betterment of the community not only for today but of 2051 or 2100 yeah, well, I mean, you can see some of that activism in some of our younger people today, right? I mean, you see it around sort of the the, uh, the Palestinian-Israeli issue. You see it around environmental issues. You see it around things like that. And and uh, while much of it seems sometimes to be one-sided, I mean, I'd rather people be engaged at some level than not engaged at all. Um, you know, I I have... I have a different view on young people. A lot of a lot of adults. Uh, I mean, we get. I, I don't know why we forget we were once young people. Uh, but what? You know, what we are you talking at... about? We were <laughs> ten at one time. Come on, I we never, came out of the room at thirty-two. That with never Eric. happened. I deny any knowledge of that. Um, you know, I I uh, you, you see kids skateboarding down at the Seven Eleven or whatever, causing trouble, and you know we forget that that was once us and that. You know, you had to go through some of those challenges to sort of develop the ideals you hold now. Um, I uh, I don't think uh, kids are generally bad. Uh, in fact, uh, earlier I mentioned I work with the Army Cadet Program now. I, I'm I, I'm in the reserves. I have the benefit of of meeting uh, 
large numbers of young people every year and and as old ones old ones age out of the program new ones come in i think uh i think we're really well positioned with some of our young, young people i think we have some tremendous up and coming young people and some leaders i i am not worried about our future at all in this country i think that uh you know leadership will always rise at some point and and take the helm and um, yeah i don't think we're doomed like some people think we are when they look at kids i think kids are going to be kids and teenagers are going to be teenagers and then at some point you become an adult <laughs> you know so i i have a, a brighter outlook on that than than a lot of people do um, I want to turn to the township and the county as a whole, but before I do that, I want to preface this, this part of the conversation with this. This is a conversation between the warden slash mayor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not a policy of council. This is his opinion and his opinion alone. His What he talks about may line up of what's going on in the county and the township, but at the end of the day, it's still his opinion. He is one vote on both councils. So with that being said, I know I'm going to get emails because I always do. <laughs> with that being <laughs> <Absolutely>. said, <laughs> I have one question for you to start off with this, and we'll start with the county perspective in your opinion what is the biggest challenge facing dufferin county today as of recording this oh uh i think more challenges right now, you could you could say one or two you don't have to just stick yeah. to one <laughs> i think uh dufferin county i think is is in a bit of a state of flux at the moment uh we our 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 makeup is made up of eight local tier municipalities three of which are, are towns, Orangeville, Shelburne, and, and Grand Valley, different size towns, Orangeville being the biggest, uh, carrying just about a little bit less than half the total population of the county. Uh, for a number of years, up till maybe the last five or six years, it's very much been eight municipalities fighting for a piece of the pie within the county uh, structure. Um, and the county was very much a... Uh, uh, you know, depending on your perspective, it was either seen as a nuisance by some, or it was seen as, uh, you know, a, a clearinghouse by others. Uh, so one of the things I took on when I first became warden in 2017 was to try to change the the makeup of, or not the makeup people-wise, but how we do things at the county. I wanted to develop better relationships between the eight municipalities and the county up and down that stream. Uh, because I'm a big believer in uh, regional economies of scale. I, I sit on the Western Wardens Caucus as well, which is uh, an, a group of 15 wardens from 15 counties in southwestern Ontario. And I see all around us uh, counties and, and groups of counties working together uh, to create economic development and, and tourism. While in many ways, Dufferin has been struggling to work within its own little eight municipality structure. And I find that tremendously frustrating. Uh, so that is sort of when I say we're in flux. We're starting to um, work better together. Uh, we're starting to put better sort of strategic planning in place. Uh, we're making a lot of changes um, uh, from everything from diversity uh, to uh, economic development, to tourism, to uh, how we manage our infrastructure. So it's very challenging for us to do that. It's uh, it's made for a lot of, um, let's say, passionate discussions uh, over the last little while. Uh, but I, I really think we're moving in a better direction as a result. So um, that's uh, probably the biggest challenge I think we face. Sort of second to that is the same one you'd hear from everybody else, infrastructure and funding around infrastructure. Um, you know, we get calls all the time from our MPPs. Uh, I get mine as the Deputy Premier of Ontario who calls and says, you know, great news. You're getting the same amount of money last as you got last year from our whatever funding stream. Or great news. We're, you're only getting cut 10%, you know. <laughs> that That to me is not great news. So you have to deal with these challenges all the time moving forward. So infrastructure and funding around it. And, uh, but on the sort of the more macro level housing, same thing you'll hear everywhere. I just came, as you said, from FCM in Calgary. It's the same problem everywhere. There's not enough houses and there's too many people. 
And uh, so we have to, to deal with that one. Uh, it's no different here in Dufferin County or any of the local eight uh, municipalities. Um, it's, it's, it's tremendously frustrating that it takes so long to build housing. It's frustrating that it costs so much. Um, and uh, meanwhile, people are struggling to get by. And, you know, the dream that I had of home ownership is not the same dream my adult children have of home ownership. And, and that's, uh, it's painful to me to realize that for them. And uh, so I want to make change. I think all of our eight municipalities are seriously trying to make change to that and make impact. Um, but it's, it, it comes with its own set of challenges of how you navigate the other government, your bureaucracies. Okay. So there's a few things I want to unpack, but I want to start with this question because I think it's an important one. You are the warden of your second tier level government, which is Dufferin County in Ontario. You were also the mayor of your own township. Mm -hmm. Now, you talked about three very big macro issues, very macro yep. issues, housing infrastructure and that that sort of commun sense of community. But every single one of those eight municipalities that make up Dufferin County have their own unique challenges that are laying ahead with them. You talk about that funding cut that the province downloads onto Dufferin County, which then gets downloaded onto the first tier, which is the municipalities. How do you, as the mayor, as the mayor of your community, but also as warden, ensure that everyone gets their fair share in your community? Because the issues that are going on in Orange Orangeville, which is the largest community in Dufferin County, I can imagine takes priority or takes a lot more energy to deal with because they have large population, more infrastructure projects than in your own community of Matheson. So how do yeah. you, Mathathon, sorry, Malathan, sorry, Melanchthon. I will, Melanchthon, I will get worry. it right. Yeah, I will I'll get it right. No ill will to people who can't pronounce it. <laughs> um, how do you ensure that all eight of your communities feel like they're getting their fair share of what pays into the second tier government while understanding yeah. that Projects cost a little bit more in rural Ontario than they do in urban center Ontario. Yeah. So that's a, a very difficult question. I mean, <laughs> luckily, most of the transfers that come into our local tier municipalities come direct from uh, the two upper levels, provincial and federal governments. So it's not for Dufferin County to sort of administer those funds out. Um, but uh, so that takes a lot of that pressure off the upper level of government here in, in Dufferin County. Uh, as for how do you ensure people are getting, everybody's getting their, their peace or whatnot, I mean, a lot of it is collaboration, to be honest. And that sounds corny and it sounds stupid and everybody says it, but, you know, it, it is. It, and But, I mean, you can't have that collaboration. What's key about that is you have to have the right people in the governments that are sitting, right? And I, I think in Dufferin County... And, and I don't I don't like to just seem like I'm giving platitudes to politicians because that's if you know me. Oh, that's not trust me, me in about two seconds, I'll ask you the political question and I'll say, what can the provincial <laughs> okay. government do better? So go yeah. give the platitude now before I ask the hard hitting question there, Derek. So we we're, we're lucky in Dufferin County. Many most of the politicians here are very community focused and most of them seem to be on the right track that that did not come without some groundwork being done, you know, in the last 10 years or so, trying to get the eight municipalities and the county moving in the same direction. I'm I'm proud to say that I'm part of that. Uh, some people would say it's my fault. I think it's I'm part of it is probably a better way to say it. Uh, but I've been a, always been an advocate for um, better, better working relationships with our neighbors because Melanchthon is not going to succeed unless my neighbor Shelburne succeeds. Uh, I believe that what's good for them is good for me. I believe that what's good for Orangeville is good for the rest of the county, which has not always been the way it's been thought of here in the county. So that was one of the biggest challenges, one of the biggest things that needed to be fixed. I think we've moved past that. Uh, at the county level right now, we are undertaking a very difficult process of reviewing all of our services from the upper to the lower tier to decide if we need to change the governance model or if we need to change individual services to work better together. I credit council for agreeing to take that journey. I asked them a couple of years ago to take it and uh, some of them 
were kicking and screaming to come in there, but I credit them with being willing to do it. And I think at the end of the day, we'll come out much better, much stronger, uh, and able to move forward better as a result of it. So you talk from the political perspective, but can I ask about the residential perspective here for a second? Sure. Because yeah. cooperation between politicians is great. It is very much needed. But the residents also need to cooperate and feel like, okay, just because we're putting money in Grand Valley doesn't mean that Orangeville isn't getting their upgrades as well. And you as the warden have to ensure that the residents of the entire county feel like they're being adequately serviced for mm -hmm. the county services and the uh, jurisdictional role that the county plays in their day-to-day -day life. Do you get a sense that there is a mindset in Dufferin County that even though my part of the county isn't getting as much as, say, Orangeville is or Grand Valley is, I'm still feeling like the county and I are moving forward as a whole? Yeah. So, I mean, there is some concern about that in some some areas and some of the residents, right? I mean, there has historically been this thought that because Orangeville uh, is the biggest center with just under half the population that everything gets, you know, sort of drained into Orangeville. It's it's not the reality. And I think part of that is because of the structure of the government and how it works, right? Uh, Dufferin County does not administer a lot of the funding that goes into Orangeville's infrastructure. Orangeville, uh, they do that on their own tax base. They make their own decisions around it. Uh, so it's not uh, people from Melanchthon don't see their tax dollars going into Orangeville sewer. When, when we don't have sewer and water here in Melanchthon, as an example, right? Uh, but it's also, it, you know, it has a lot to do with how you, how you uh, push things out to the, to the people, how you explain the services you do have um, and, it, and service levels, right? Maintaining them is key. Right? One of the biggest ones in Dufferin County is, is road clearing, right? We, we live in an area where we get, we're north of Toronto, so we do get a fair bit of snow in the winter. Uh, we get a lot of storms. We're the highest point in Southern Ontario, uh, elevation wise. So we can get very windy up here. Um, so the, the way the road gets plowed in Grand Valley, the way the county road in Grand Valley gets plowed at the south end of the municipality has to be the same as the way the road in the north part in my area gets plowed. And our staff at the county level and at our local tier levels are great at working together to do those things, get them done right, get them done sort of relatively in time. And as a result, you don't have a lot of complaint from the residents other than in my area, you know, the damn road plow hit my mailbox again. Uh, I need now need my 18th new mailbox. Um, same I'm assuming you're speaking from from experience there, Dare, because that, that well, seems like I a story mean, that you I just mean, randomly pulled out of the air. <laughs> well, I hear I get a lot of complaints in the spring. When are you putting up the new mailbox for me? Uh out, out in the, one of the country roads. I have I'm you know, I live in one of the small villages. I have the can the Canadian po or Canada Post community mailbox. My complaint is when are we shoveling out the community post mail <laughs> mailboxes? Because they're drifted in with eight feet of snow. So Good but way yeah, I mean, it's all about yeah, pushing ahead. those services out in a good way. So I want to, because I get accused on the show of only talking about negative things. So I want to flip to a sort of a positive spin on municipalities here for a second before we start wrapping up. And I've got to ask, what's the thing you're proud of when it comes to the county, when it comes to the township? What's the thing that you look at and you say, you know what? We have our challenges like every other municipality has in this country. But we've got this going for us. What is that for you? Uh, there's a lot. I'm uh, I'm I'm really proud, sort of at the county level. I'm I'm proud that we have taken a lot of steps toward changing how we do things with regards to diversity. We have a very rapidly changing demographic in Dufferin County. Uh, we have a lot of folks from the city moving in. A lot of immigrant and, and immigrants to the country moving into the to our particularly Shelburne and Orangeville, which are towns that are growing very rapidly. Uh, I'm proud that we have managed to, I think, keep up with that and change our community to uh, be welcoming and to be reflective of those communities. Um, 
I'm proud that in my local chair in Melanchthon, that we have uh, modernized as quickly as we have, um, that we have uh, 167 wind turbines in our small agricultural community. We have some of the best farmland in Canada. We have a large and growing Mennonite population. Uh, but, uh, you know, as an example, at our municipal office, we have a hitching post for Mennonite buggies right next to the electric car charging station. So the, uh, you know, the the transposition of those things is is really strange, but it's something that I think I'm really proud of seeing uh, my municipality evolve to. I'm proud that um, our our service levels have not deteriorated. In fact, they've probably gotten better, uh, even though we're in we're in challenging financial times. Uh, but what I would what what I could be really proud of is that if we can find a way to make a real dent into the housing issue uh, so that more people could be securely housed and, and not feel as, as left behind as they are. But that's a, that's something we're working on currently. Uh, I really look forward to the day when I say, when I can say I'm, I'm proud of that. Okay. I was going to turn to my next subject, but I want to just ask one question on just what you just said there. Do you have hope you can do it? Because I'm not trying to be rude or disrespectful, but every municipality is having a housing crisis. Every municipality is facing challenges around infrastructure. Municipalities are trying to be more proactive in getting more developers because as much as people think, municipalities do not build houses. You are not yep. the ones building them. So are you setting in place the work that needs to be done today for the growth of Dufferin County of 2051 or 2075. Yeah, I think uh, in Dufferin County and in all of our eight municipalities, the answer to that is yes. We're very conscious of uh, the numbers we're expected to grow by by 2051 and, and those thresholds that are created by other levels of government. Uh, and not only do we, um, not only are we currently planning for that growth. But we, I think many of us would actually like to see those numbers increased rather than decreased. Um, the, the challenge, as you rightly said, is, is getting people to actually build the houses and do the, do the work. We have a skilled trade shortage in not only in, in my area, but in the country. Uh, so that's a very big challenge. I mean, we could uh, allow any kind of development tomorrow, getting people to actually build, drive, drive the nails and cut the wood. That's the challenge. Um, that's something we're working on both locally at the county and at the Western Wardens Caucus is skill trades training and, and how to, to stream people into that. Um, but yes, we are we are putting in place things that will aid growth down down the road. Uh, some of our municipalities are, are actively taking steps to sort of speed up growth like right now in our municipalities. M mine, Melanchthon is one of them. We have a, a developer with a um, sort of a different proposal, not the same, you know, four bedroom cookie cutter, you know, six uh, model uh, development. He wants to come in with a different type of things, uh, smaller, uh, more affordable, more attainable type housing on a property. Um, we're trying to actually remove the barriers in front of them, not add more barriers, uh, which is something our council has unanimously decided on, on doing. So I think there are while there's always going to be people who are like, no, this doesn't go here. No, you can't have that there. Uh, the, You're the telling me nimbyism is alive and well in a different county there? Yeah. there? Oh, I, uh, I was just reading about it uh, on an article on, on uh, the news before I talked to you. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think the majority of people want to actually be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. And um I think uh, I see big things coming for the county as a result. So I want to turn to my last subject, and it's my favorite subject, because I'm coming through southwestern, south central Ontario later this August, and I am going to be coming and making a stop back in Orangeville and Dufferin County and Melanchthon. And I want to know, from a tourist perspective, what are the things that you think people should do in Dufferin County or in Melanchthon that you don't get the opportunity to talk about as much as you should? 
Excellent. Well, I mean, we have a lot to offer in the county. We don't have we don't have any of the big tourist attractions per se, but it depends on what you want to do. We have uh, beautiful scenery. We have uh, the Melanchthon Wind Farm with 167 turbines. It's a great thing to see. We have a lot of people stop on the highway looking at those. They have an educational center here in the in the in the township uh, uh, to learn more about uh, that type of uh, thing. We have lots of some of the greatest farm markets in uh, southern Ontario here, uh, including one of my favorites, which is Lennox Farm, which is just over um, a bit from me. They these folks are innovative and creative and what they grow on their farm and what they market in their in their store. They have rhubarb juice, uh, uh, you know, uh, all kinds of meat, uh, you know, uh, fresh this and that and the other thing. I mean, there's nothing you can't get there. It's it's amazing. So you have to stop at Lennox Farm if you come. Um, we have uh, Mono Cliffs Provincial Park, uh, which is some of the most uh, striking, beautiful scenery you'll see in, in this part of Ontario. Uh, we have lots of great inns and bed and breakfasts uh, all across the county. Um, we have uh, lots of sort of adventure or, uh, um, you know, focus type uh, bed and breakfast like uh, horseback riding, uh, weekend and horse adventure, that type of thing. A lot of those kinds of things. If you're a foodie, Orangeville and Grand Valley and Shelburne, I mean, Orangeville has the majority of them. Some of the best restaurants in Southern Ontario, uh, Bluebird, uh, Barley Vine Rail, all kinds of them. Um, if you talk to Lisa, and I know you will, if you're coming, the mayor of Orangeville, uh, she'll be able to set you up down there. Um, Shelburne has a great place called Beyond the Gate. Uh, it's a sort of a, a chef's menu kind of restaurant. Uh, it doesn't have a big menu. It's like, here's what we're serving today. But the, the chefs are, are, are amazing there. Uh, Grand Valley has a place called the Chop House, which you're not going to beat uh, uh, beat the, the steaks and, and meat down there. Uh, the Grand River is beautiful to see. Uh, and uh, I mean, depending on the time of year you're in, Orangeville has all kinds of great little festivals. If you're coming in late August, Rib Fest is in there. I'm not sure of the particular weekend, but Rib Fest is a big hit in Orangeville. Um, Hopefully and, it's before uh, AMO because that's what the only reason I'm coming back to Ontario is for the Association of, Man of Municipalities of Ontario Convention. So if it's I'd, before I'd, or after that, I'm coming to Rimfest, man. <laughs> I'll get you the days, but I'm not sure. But uh, but yeah, the Rimfest group they travel around this local area at sort of in the August time frame. Uh, but yeah, there's there's tons of stuff to do here. We don't have as developed a tourism market as we would like. Uh, we don't have a, uh, but it's something we're working on. And we, it's one of the things we've tried to change over the last couple of years is being more focused on our tourism and, and building a library of the assets that we have so we can push them out. But there's uh, there's no shortage of stuff to do, places to go, food to eat around here. So is there a place in the community that you go to? So after a long day of a uh, county council meeting or even a township a meeting, is there a place in the community that you can go and de-stress? Just let it all go, knowing that tomorrow morning you're going to have to get back up and try to leave the communities better off than you left it the day before. Yeah. I don't know that I have one particular place. Um uh, Come on, every other mayor's mayor or warden says that they go just they go to their house and they drink beer. So <laughs> I I was going there. But uh <laughs> I mean, every now and again after county council, we, uh, some of us will go out to uh Mill Street uh, uh pub and on the sit on the patio depending on the time of year or Chuck's Roadhouse in Orangeville. But most of the time I do just that. I come home. Uh, I have two of my grandkids live with me. Um, so, I mean, that's kind of where my wheelhouse is for de-stressing and relaxing is uh, my, my dogs and my, uh, my family and my, uh, and my grandkids. Um, so that's, that's what I do. Um, yeah. Sounds peaceful. I mean, it, well, so I try to make it. <laughs> try to, grandkids can't always be peaceful. My mother uh, and father yeah. would agree with that statement. <laughs> So my final question. So we started by talking about you. We're ending by talking about the township and the county. And I've got to ask uh, a two-part question. Usually it's only one, but I'm going to sort of 
make you play a little bit of Sophie's Choice here, if you don't mind. Um, in your opinion, what makes Dufferin County and the township of Melanchthon such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? I don't know that I know the answer to that, to be honest, um, because here's one of, the, and this sort of goes back to one of the things, I, I know you're more of a happy answer for this question, but this is one of the frustrations I have in politics is that every time we sit down to create like a tourism plan or a economic development plan, the first thing that comes out of people's mouth when you ask them, what's great about Melanchthon and what's great about Dufferin? And everybody says, we're so unique. The fact of the matter is we're not. We're not unique. Like in Melanchthon, we have lots of great farmland. There's other municipalities, some really close to us that have great farmland. We have some really nice, beautiful rolling hills and scenery in Mulmer and, and in Mono Township. Uh, lots of other places have that. I think what makes us um, what makes us willing to or more adaptable for the future is the people we have here, the willingness to move forward. Uh, I don't know if it makes us unique, but it certainly makes us a great place to live. Uh, we have a great sense of community here in Dufferin County. We have uh, some wonderful people. We have some real uh, brains. We have some, um, you know, some salt of the earth farmers who will uh, take the time to help stop, fix your tire if you get a blowout on the highway. But at the same time, we have a lot of really well-off executive folks who, uh, uh, work in Toronto and have a summer home up here. So we have a great mix of people from all over the world. We have, I think it's just a great community to live in. I don't know that it's terribly unique, but it's certainly a great place to live. I love honest answers and I'm never looking for the happy-go-lucky. I'm looking for honesty in this show. And Warden, Mayor, Darren, thank you so much. I appreciate taking time out of your busy day to sit down with me and talk about Dufferin County, talk about the township of Melanchthon, and just talk about yourself, because I think municipalities are truly the front lines of politics. So you're, they're the ones who have to deal with the most issues, and they're the ones who deal with the people on a regular basis compared to their MPPs or MPs, not saying that they're not good, but there's always a special place for county councillors or mayors or wardens in my heart. So thank you so much for taking time to sit down and do this interview. Thank you, and uh, thanks for having me, and hope to see you in August when you're done. Thanks so much for tuning in for another great episode of the Crossword Interviews. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our great conversations that we have coming up. We are back all for the month of July, but it's going to be a shortened, condensed version of the show. Every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, we have brand new episodes, so you will not want to miss those. If you can, head over to the Cross Border Interviews website and hit the support the page now. Every donation, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. The support the show link is also in the show notes below. As we are heading off for Canada Day weekend, I just want to take a moment and remind everyone, if you are thinking of drinking, please do not get behind the wheel. Call a cab, get a friend, or get a family member to drive you home. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and as always, just keep talking.